right, so what we're going to do is I'll introduce the meeting, we'll have a pledge, and then I'll introduce uh, both of you, and then you can take the presentation from there. Okay? So, I'll get to record. <laughs> we're now recording. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Town of Queensbury Town Board Meeting. It is September 28th, 2020, and the time is 7.03 p.m. Before we begin regular agenda items, would you all please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. All right, so we have two presentations tonight. Um, one from the Fun for Lake George, um, and um, they're going to talk about the hemlock woolly aldigit, or HWA, and I'll introduce them in a minute. And then uh, from Catholic Charities, the uh, talk about the federal SNAP program will be Ben Driscoll. Okay, so for our first presentation, um, basically establishing a, a sealable pilot project for the Lake George region to identify and stop hemlock woolly aldigid we have from the Fund for Lake George, Eric Sy, he's the executive director, and Zach Zemek from uh, the uh, conservation, and uh, he's a GIS analyst for the Nature Conservancy. Okay, so either one of you would like to start? Ron. Sure, I'll start. Yeah, this is Eric. Uh, thank you, John. And it's Zach Simic from the Nature Conservancy, who is actually a conservation and GIS analyst for the Nature Conservancy, but he works with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And so we're going to speak to you, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm joining you by phone. I, I could not get, I have to uh, concede here, confess, my Zoom link to work. So. <clears throat> Apologies for that, but fortunately Zach did, because he's going to be sharing a PowerPoint with you. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. First off. Yeah, we can hear you fine, me. Eric. Yeah. Uh, all right. I was going to so zoom in on that. I think you've, you've, you've all seen it in the news. It's been pretty widely reported that we have had a, uh, a recent uh, infestation detected on at Lake George. Uh, and it is that that will give us more on the on the details. But it's it's covering 250 plus acres and about a mile and a half of uh, shoreline on the eastern shore of Lake George. And so what we have done in in response to this uh, this very unfortunate news. I mean, this is a, a very serious situation. That just a bit of background: the hemlock woolly adelgid has, has ravaged literally millions of acres of hemlock in the eastern U.S. And I don't need to tell you all that Lake George, the signature tree in the Lake George watershed, is the, the, the eastern hemlock. Uh, about 80% of the, 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 the species in the, in the basin are hemlock. So the potential devastation to the Lake George watershed is enormous. So in a, in a very rapid uh, uh, organizing effort with the fund, APIF, the Lake George Land Conservancy, and a, a, a full suite of others, we have uh, designed and are now implementing a four-stage program to, as, as John put it, to seek and stop spread of hemlock woolly adelgid to the fullest extent possible, employing every tool in our toolbox, including
including, as Zach will describe, remote sensing technology. Uh, and what that is designed to do is to allow us to identify much earlier than would otherwise be the case uh, potentially affected trees, impacted trees that have, uh, are under stress from this uh, invasive, this terrestrial invasive species. Um, and what that will allow us to do then is to send out survey crews to inspect uh, what we see by satellite and then as necessary to, to treat and control the spread. So this is a, a full court press all out effort and it's all in financially. The fund is the lead in investor in this uh, effort. The, the total budget, and Zach will go over that for you, is a, a 125,000 plus to put, put this in motion. Uh, and we'll, we'll break it down for you, the, the elements of the, the, uh, the budget. But the bottom line is we are looking for, we really need partner support to fully meet the, um, the project budget. As, as I said, the fund is the lead investor here, uh, and we have committed 75000 of the, the 125 plus to get this underway immediately without delay. And, and without further ado, what I'm going to do is to, particularly since I'm on the phone, but I'm going to hand it over to Zach, who will now take us through a brief PowerPoint that describes this four-stage project uh, in detail. And last point, this is designed to be scalable beyond the Lake George watershed. It's designed to grow as we learn and apply additional uh, remote sensing technologies beyond those Zach will feature in his presentation. And, and, it's, and it's, I think most importantly, nothing like this has ever been done before where we have pulled together public and private interests at all levels of government, including the federal government, the Forest Service is uh, one of our technical uh, advisors here in a, in a voluntary capacity. Um, <laughs> to hopefully, hopefully uh, create a new model for much better control of, of this species uh, and its impact on our, our hemlocks in, in Lake George and beyond. So, Zach, can you um, pick it up from there, please? Sure thing. Thanks for that introduction, Eric. So good evening, everyone. This is Zach Simic speaking. I'm the Conservation GIS Analyst with the Nature Conservancy's Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. And Eric provided a nice frame of reference for this project. And now I just want to take a few minutes to dive under the hood and share in a little bit greater detail what it is that we're trying to achieve with this approach. So as we've learned, unfortunately, the hemlock we adelged, a devastating invasive insect, is present within the Lake George watershed. What you're looking at here is the watershed boundary and highlighted in green are the abundant eastern hemlock forests that are found throughout that watershed. We first found HWA in the Lake George region on Prospect Mountain in 2017. And thankfully, that was an isolated infestation only affecting three trees, which were quickly treated with insecticide and deemed eradicated. Unfortunately, HWA was found again this year at the Glen Island campground facility on the eastern shore of the lake. It was actually found by a citizen scientist. And over the last several weeks, a variety of partners, including the DEC, Cornell University's Hemlock Initiative, and several local conservation organizations have been busy surveying this particular infestation to get a, a thorough understanding of how widespread it is. And unfortunately, what we've found is that this new infestation is well established and quite widespread. As Eric mentioned, it is currently uh, covering over 250 acres along about a mile and a half of shoreline and includes a large 200 plus acre site as well as a smaller satellite infestation. This is truly unfortunate news for the watershed, given the abundant hemlock resources. Uh, and in response to this, there will be an intensive management action that will um, begin next week and, and probably take at least three weeks 
to help uh, chemically treat some of these trees to limit the adelgids growth and spread. But when we're faced with an infestation of this size, it really makes us think if we had a better early detection tool in our toolbox, such as remote sensing, could this infestation have been found sooner, giving us better opportunity to respond to the infestation while it was smaller in size? And that is exactly what this initiative uh, aims to do. So we'll be using a suite of remote sensing technologies to survey a large portion of the southeastern Adirondacks, extending from the northern borders of the Lake George watershed south to about Troy, New York, which prior to detecting HWA in the Lake George region, Troy was believed to be the northernmost edge of the established uh, infestations. So we'll use remote sensing across this 4,400 square mile area to help identify forests in decline, which could be essentially a canary in the coal mine that indicates HWA could be present at these sites. So we have a suite of technology at our disposal, everything from satellites to manned aircraft to unmanned aerial systems or drones to even on the ground work. But for this initial cut of the pilot project, We'll be utilizing uh, three freely available satellite data uh, platforms, including Landsat, Sentinel, and Worldview satellites. And what these technologies allow us to do is to essentially measure the greenness of vegetation. In other words, provide us with an objective measurement of the plant's health. And we can look at this measurement over time to identify areas of forest that, over the past several years, are potentially declining in health more additional ground surveys. As Eric mentioned, this is a multi-stage project that involves several different uh, components, which we aim to advance in parallel when possible to accelerate some of the on-the-ground outcomes that we expect uh, from this effort. So currently underway in stage one are intensive delimitation or survey um, and control efforts to address the known infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid at Glen Island and shelving rock. These will continue through October uh, with those three weeks of chemical treatment. At the same time, we currently are beginning, actually just this week, uh, some resource-based early detection surveys utilizing a crew of four professional uh, forest pest surveyors to search throughout other portions of the watershed in an attempt to identify any other uh, previously undetected infestations. Meanwhile, we are beginning development of the model, which will be used to identify declines in hemlock health. We hope to have this ready in early February, at which time we will deploy additional ground crews to survey for another four weeks, following up on those hot spots or areas of declining forest health that were identified in our, in our model. And the goal here is that all, all of these collective efforts will help us to better identify any um, other you know, previously unidentified infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid that are currently in the watershed. This will provide us a better opportunity to rapidly respond to those infestations and mitigate any of the impacts that they could have on our hemlock resources um, and the additional services that they provide. And as Eric mentioned, this is about a $125,000 plus project, which is uh, the costs are allocated to both ground-based survey uh, efforts as well as development of a model uh, that once, um, once it's prepared can be scaled to the larger Adirondack Park or even New York State. Mm -hmm. And I will pause now to um, ask if there are any questions. Well, are there any questions, folks? I'm not really out of you. Uh, Zach, you don't have any pictures uh, so that the audience can uh, search the hemlocks to see if there is an infestation and then report that? Do you have anything on that, Zach? That's a great question. I actually do not have any pictures of the Adelja itself in the slideshow. Um, however, I, I, I would suggest doing that. Um, there are several press releases that have gone out regarding this project. So if you do a quick 
quick Google, you'll definitely find pictures of the Adelgid. Uh, this is a good time to be looking for them. Uh, you'll see that big waxy wool that they leave on the underside of hemlock branches. You know, you'll, you'll, that's a great question, John. And in addition to what Zach just said, there are specific uh, web links, uh, both to uh, DEC and to the Cornell's uh, New York Hemlock Initiative, uh, where you can get, you know, soup to nuts understanding of what the adelgid is, including ID uh, photographs of what to look for, uh, as Zach has described. So uh, it wasn't included, and this, this was this was really focusing on the project. But you're you're exactly right. People need to know what what we're looking for, and it, and it, and it's really important to point out, though, it's it's a tough. And, and Zach will attest to this. He's in the field quite a bit on on, on, on this front. It's it's tough to, to find. It's tough to identify. And you can imagine in mature hemlocks way up high in the canopy, uh, this, this could be a, a, an infested tree that from the ground you cannot see. So all the more reason to bring these additional technologies to bear that will give us uh, an eyes on view that's not otherwise possible. And I got to stress again that it, it starts with satellite technologies because they're freely available, but does not stop there. Uh, as we go, we're laying a foundation for uh, a process that is going to get increasingly um, uh, more precise and we'll be refining the, the model that Zach mentioned um, as we go, as we learn. And, and our absolute intent <laughs> is to have a high-powered tool that makes a real difference in, in seeking and uh, stopping this highly destructive uh, invasive species. And, and, you know, we appeal to the town, as we are with, with other uh, public and private entities, to, to consider participating as a, as a co-funder here. Very similar, I might add, to the way we have addressed aquatic invasive species at Lake George, whereas hopefully folks know uh, full well that it is a, uh, a co-funded uh, program, the, the Lake George Park Commission's Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Program. Uh, we we co-invest uh, as equals. So half of it's provided by the state of New York. The other half of the annual budget is provided by a consortium of interest. So this isn't quite the same, but it's a similar model where co-investment is key to, to marshalling the resources necessary to do everything humanly possible to uh, prevent this species from uh, altering forever the, uh, the, the, the face, the, 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 the forest, of uh, the Lake Shore George watershed and beyond. So, all right. Well, I I want to um, thank you, Eric, and I want to thank you, Zach, uh, Eric from the Pond for Lake George, and Zach from the Nature Conservancy, for your progressive and aggressive action in trying to protect Lake George on this matter. And I know, uh, Eric. Uh, you are attacking Lake George's uh, ill impacts from many different directions, and this just being one of them. And thank you for all you and the Punk of Lake George and everything that you do. And Zach, I want to thank you for everything that you do in the Nature Conservancy, a wonderful organization. And it uh, seems to me they're very lucky to have you as well. So thank you, both of you. And Zach, before you leave, maybe you transfer the host back to me. Oh, you did. Yeah, th th thank you, John, and thank you, everybody, for your interest and concern here as we move forward. Okay. Uh, we need all the help we can get with it, so thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. Take care. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, next. Um, Catholic Charities, Federal SNAP. SNAP is an acronym for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. 
and um, Ben Bristol, who is the Nutrition Outreach and Education Program Coordinator. We'll talk about no, SNAP and other things I, as well. No slides. No, no, I'm all set. Presentation. Uh, uh, yeah. All presentation. Thank you, Supervisor Strau. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, I appreciate the invitation to, uh, uh, to come over this evening. My name is Ben Driscoll. I work for Catholic Charities of Saratoga, Warren, and Washington Counties. Uh, I've been with the organization uh, for just over five years now. Um, I've been affiliated with the organization for over uh, 30 years. Um, my role at, at Catholic Charities is to administer the Nutrition Outreach and Education Program, which is a, um, a, a program funded by New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance. That's the organization that funds social service agencies uh, throughout New York uh, State, as well as uh, down in the boroughs of New York City. Um, in 2019, um, approximately um, uh, 3,700 different households each month received SNAP benefits. That re represents about 6,800 people each month that are again receiving SNAP benefits. That represents about 11% of the, uh, the county's population, if, if my math is, is good. Um, there's still more uh, households, individuals, and families that are eligible for the program and are not yet receiving it. That's for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the program uh, has also been known as uh, food stamps, which has a negative connotation and, and people think that, uh, that most people or many people that receive food stamps or, or SNAP benefits um, are cheating the system. Um, the, uh, the numbers in New York State, as well as uh, throughout the United States, are pretty much consistent. Approximately 40% of the individuals who benefit from SNAP benefits are 16 years of age and younger. Approximately 25 to 30% are 60 years of age and older. So that represents about two-thirds of the population uh, who receive food stamps uh, locally. Um, of the remaining um, uh, 30 to 35 uh, percent, a majority of those individuals have a regular monthly income. That can be from employment, um, sometimes two or three jobs, uh, part-time, seasonal, um, self-employment type of, of income. Uh, some of it is uh, uh, from disability income. They're not physically or, or mentally able to, um, uh, to work or work full-time. Um, you, all, you all have seen um, uh, individuals who um, commit fraud or abuse. That represents in Warren County um, less than 2% of those who actually receive the benefit throughout the year. Um, they get their picture in the postar and, and, and they're caught and, and have to pay back uh, that money. Um, I want to focus on the 98% the plus who um, are deserving. It uh, it helps improves the quality of life in those households. It's been shown that a child who has had a, uh, a balanced uh, uh, diet of uh, three meals a day does better in school. Uh, an adult does better in the workplace, and a senior citizen is more independent and self-sufficient. Um, most importantly, uh, from a cost-effective uh, uh, standpoint. Um, they don't go to the doctor's offices as often or get admitted to the uh, hospital, uh, which cuts down on Medicaid costs, which uh, in Warren County uh, is a substantial uh, part of our, uh, of our budget. I should also uh, say, if those that don't know, I also serve on the Warren County Board of Supervisors along with uh, John representing Glens Falls Fifth Ward, and that encompasses um, Glens Falls Hospital, uh, Haviland's Cove uh, Beach, um, um, uh, the uh, Industrial Park on Prines Island, um, and abuts the uh, town of Queensbury in three or four points uh, uh, in that area. 
so uh, along the river. And uh, I've been doing that for three years uh, after taking a, a, a few years off and uh, prior to that serving eight years on the Glens Falls Common Council. So I, I appreciate uh, presentations that are short and right to the point, and I'll try to do uh, that tonight. Um, uh, my job is, is to um, educate and inform the public about the SNAP program, as well as other federal uh, programs. Uh, we're uh, soon going to be coming up to the um, heating season, and the Home Energy Assistance Program uh, plays a, a tremendous role in um, uh, keeping people safe and healthy uh, uh, during the winter season. Uh, too many senior citizens, and, and seniors uh, represent a substantial uh, percentage of, of the people that I serve, um, uh, make choices between uh, paying the heating bill, um, buying food, uh, uh, filling subscriptions that are important to their uh, health and, and well-being. Um, they don't have to. Uh, uh, the SNAP program and federal programs don't supplant um, uh, a household's um, uh, income and expenses. They supplement it. And that's why the program is called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It works hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the families. Uh, and again, my role is to, uh, uh, to shake the branches, get out there in the community as best I can uh, uh, during COVID-19 and just educate and inform, work with elected officials, uh, community and business leaders. Um, uh, it's, a, it, it's not surprising that uh, many of the people that, that you uh, uh, may have worked with uh, were receiving uh, SNAP benefits, uh, people that you, uh, you worship with, that you uh, see uh, living uh, just down the street, uh, walking their dogs past your homes. Uh, so it's important that, um, uh, that we all uh, are ambassadors to, to the programs that exist. Uh, in Warren County, we've got a, a, a great uh, Department of Social Services. Um, uh, we've got a, a, a super office for the aging, uh, veteran services, uh, and certainly uh, public health. Uh, I'm proud to say that my wife uh, uh, works for Warren County Public Health. These are uh, what I call uh, people program uh, services. Uh, uh, we've got to uh, re repair uh, roads and, and infrastructure and all those types of things, but, uh, but never at the expense of uh, programs that, that serve uh, uh, individuals and families. So um, every October 1st, uh, the federal government changes the, um, uh, the amount that a household can receive in gross earnings in order to qualify for the SNAP program. They also um, uh, change the, uh, the maximum amount that a single individual or uh, uh, larger families uh, can receive. Um, as an example, um, a household with a disabled or aged 60 plus member or dependent, uh, paying dependent care expenses. And that would include um, uh, parents who are paying for daycare. Um, they go under the 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, uh, which is uh, the amount, the maximum amount is increasing from $2,082 per month to $2,026. Um, and the benefit amount, um, is 190 is changing from 194 up to 204 dollars. What I tell people is is that um, uh, 194 or 204 dollars. If you round that off to 200, uh, that's approximately uh, 2,400 dollars that an individual is receiving. A single individual is receiving in be in benefits during the course of the year. Um, I, I challenge any of you to find a hospital. Uh, that will allow you to put your head on a, on a pillow for one night that someone isn't going to be paying uh, uh, less than $2,400. So again, it's, uh, the program is designed uh, to help uh, improve uh, the quality of, of life for individuals, keep them healthier uh, and safer. And um, I brought some, uh, some business cards. Uh, uh, when these numbers change, and I'll have to do all the calculations. I will get some information uh, 
uh, electronically uh, sent over to the town hall as well as some some paper copies and uh, I would encourage you uh, after you grab my business card uh, give me a call anytime um, uh, my Catholic charity number is there and if you want to call me as a supervisor call me as a supervisor the telephone number is there also thank you for your time and attention and um, um, yes yes yeah. um, there's a group on Facebook, I think it's called Glens Falls Cares or yes. something like that. Yeah. I had noticed a couple of comments the other day about there had maybe been extra SNAP ben benefits associated with COVID and people hadn't received them. They were asking where and, to go. And my home. son actually um, uh, responded in. for okay. me. Um, right. But yeah, um, in addition to the regular SNAP benefits, um, uh, they had the pandemic um, EBT, which is the, the, the card that people receive their benefits for. Uh, families uh, during, I think it was May and June, uh, received um, who had uh, school-aged children who weren't able to participate in the, uh, breakfast, the and uh, breakfast and lunch yep. programs. Even if they weren't a member, uh, a participant in SNAP, or if they weren't receiving, the household wasn't receiving Medicaid, they were still entitled. So they, basically the school district was doing uh, the information on that so in but the again future, it's, it's it's if we ever see a question we send them to catholic charities you could send them to catholic charities okay. yeah and i and i work with with uh with all of the area food pantries as well as a uh, a whole host of uh not-for-profits i was on the phone with the coordinator of the queensbury united Metro methodist uh, food pantry this morning uh on a matter and again um it's basically you know working together uh to make sure that uh that no one falls through the cracks. So I appreciate your time and, and have a good meeting. I'm gonna hang around for a little while. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks. you, Dad, and, and thank you for what you do in Catholic Charities and the SNAP program. It's a great program, and uh, no better person than you that I know of is getting the word out there and making sure the people that need it get it. All right, can you explain why the off doesn't, doesn't work, though? Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Councilman Menevier, seconded by Councilman Perone, Councilperson Perone. All those in favor of moving into the Queensbury Local Board of Health, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right, <coughs> aye, we're unanimous, we're into the uh, Local Board of Health. So, Rose, if you'll introduce the first public hearing to the public. It's a public hearing on a sewage disposal variance application Keith and Sarah Barton. All right, Keith and Sarah Barton, who live at 120 Sunnyside North, um, want to install a septic system. And with certain components, they're going to need variances from the town code. There are, they are requesting four variances. They go as follows. The first variance, the infiltrator, H20, chamber absorption system to be located beneath the driveway. Two, 
absorption field to be one foot five inches from the property line instead of the required 10 foot setback. Septic tank to be three foot five inches from the property line instead of the required 10 foot setback. And distribution box to be 1.5 uh, feet from the property line instead of the required 10 foot setback. And this is for property on 120 Sunnyside North owned by Keith and Sarah Park. So uh, I see we have an agent for the applicant. And if you want to introduce yourself and expand what, on what I said, I'd welcome that. Good evening, board. I'm Tom Hutchins, uh, Hutchins Engineering, Queensbury. Here on behalf of Keith and Sarah Barton, who are here with us tonight as well. Uh, the Bartons have owned this property since uh, for 40 years or thereabouts. And uh, historically, there has been a mobile home on this property that was very close to the road. Uh, in fact, a portion of it was actually over the right of way, the right of way bounds, and that had been there since the 1960s. Uh, the home, that home has been removed. Uh, it hadn't been used in some years, and it's dilapidated. And I don't know if you remember it, but it looked like this. It was a pink mobile home that was past its useful life. Um, what they'd like to do is construct a small residence on this parcel. The parcel is somewhat constrained um, being on the lake and there are neighboring water supplies. Uh, the location we have chosen for this wastewater system uh, maintains setbacks to all water supplies, neighboring um, as well as the shoreline and stays away from a, a decent slope that goes down toward the shore. Uh, it is located beneath the driveway, and that's the, that's the quest of the variances we're, we're requesting. Uh, we've shown the, uh, an H20 rated infiltrator um, chamber system, which is, which is built to be installed in traffic areas, and, and I think this board's seen that system before. Um, and the other variance we're asking for is property line setback just just uh, because it is a somewhat narrow parcel and, and where we have it is where we feel is the best technical place for this system on the parcel. And uh, we'll be, assuming we're successful in this variance request, we'll be uh, uh, going before the planning board and perhaps the zoning board with for the residence itself. But with that, I turn it over to the board okay. uh, for any questions. Thank you. Questions from the board? I was there today. Uh, I took a look at, at the property. Uh, I, I had a picture from the town's uh, website, so I did see that there was a, uh, a mobile home there, which there's a big hole where the mobile home was. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I assume that's approximately where that new septic system is going to go. Yes. Right there. A little further back off the road, but okay. yeah. Okay, all right. But again, an extremely narrow uh, piece of. Uh, uh, property there there's not much you can do uh, I like the fact that you're trying to keep it as far away from the lake as possible so it's up at the top of the hill next to the road so uh, I didn't see much problem with it okay, okay. Uh, all right. If there's anybody who's watching us YouTube, um, please call area code 518-761-8225. I think you've got it on the YouTube. I've got my phone here. 
Uh, you need uh, to have a caller ID. I will not accept uh, generic names. It has to be your name. I will accept that. So the public hearing is open. anything further. Are there any additional questions to ask of the applicant's agent? Um, yeah, I just had one other question. Tom? Tom. There was no other pre-existing system here? There was nothing that... Yeah, it was just uh, just on the lake side of where the, the mobile home was, okay. up on the high ground. So almost underneath it. And it was an antiquated, yes, that, that'll, that'll be dug out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions? How about a resolution to approve it? Close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Thank you. I'll make a motion. Motion made by Second. Council Person Medifier, seconded by Council Person McGee. A roll call vote on this, please, Rel. Council Person Freer? Yes. Barone? Yes. McGee? Yes. Strau? Yeah. And Medivere? Yes. All right. Passes. Good luck. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Good luck to keep the third part. So there are additional chairs for anybody out there that would like to come in. Please wear your mask. Okay. Would you introduce the next request for sewage disposal variance, please, Rose? Sure. It's a public hearing on sewage disposal variance application of James Broda. Okay. James Broda owns a residence at 136 uh, Cleverdale Road. And have uh, filed an application for variances from provisions of the town of Queen's Bay on-site uh, sewage disposal ordinance, chapter 136, to maintain a pre-existing non-conforming septic system with the placement of the leaching system. So what they're asking for the leaching system is that it be 65 foot from the well in lieu of the required 100 foot setback. And the second variance that they are requesting is 10 foot from the dwelling instead of the required 20 foot setback. So we have a public hearing on that. Is there an agent or the owners who wish to speak to this application? Please come forward and identify yourself. Morgan Gazettis, agent for James Rota. And, and you are again, I did. Morgan Gazettis. Morgan Gazettis. Morgan, M O R G N. Morgan Gazettis. Morgan. Yes, sir. And would you spell your last name for me? Is that a G A Z E T O S? All right. Uh, Mr. Cassetta, would you elaborate? Tell us a little bit more about this system. I don't know if you had a chance, uh, Supervisor, to read my letter that I accompanied with the, with the variance application, but it's, a, it's kind of an interesting story. Yeah. Um, I've come before a couple of boards. I, I do docks up in the lake and for zoning or for uh, you know, land use variance and stuff, but this is the one occasion where. I'm doing my, for myself, and it's, it's interesting because this is the one time where I couldn't find a solution to the problem by changing anything. And so my friend, Mr. Vroda, acquired this house from the days of the past, and his girlfriend had it, and I conned him into letting me get under contract for it because it'd be closer to my parents' place and closer to him. And the funny thing about this is Anywhere I go different with that septic system, I get close, I encroach on the distance to the neighbor's well. And if not, I'm only bringing it closer to my own well. So it's funny how the minimum variance is the existing. And then Mr. Broda still owns it. He let me start working on it before I acquired it. So we were doing the siding and the uh, windows in the wintertime. And my guy John is pushing in the bathroom window to me, you know, and we're gonna go retrim it and I put my boot right to the bathroom floor. I mean like knee deep to the bathroom floor. 
And so the whole reason I'm here before you is because it passed for the, uh, the transfer in September. But the house is unusable because I can't put the bathroom back together. So I'm not changing floor size, bedroom count, nothing. It's a, and the bathroom's maybe eight by six. It's just, I guess, the way the tub was, because it comes down partially under a slab, the water run along the joists and just eat in that one spot in front of the window. And through I went. And then we're cleaning up later. And here comes Dave Hatt. And he goes, oh, you're going to need a permit for that. I thought, oh, no big deal. It's a bathroom floor, right? How bad can this be? And thanks to COVID and all that, here I am. <laughs> the never ending bathroom. OK. <clears throat> Before I open the public hearing, are there any town board questions of the applicant's agent? Considering um, you know, the 65 foot from, from the well, uh, and even you know you said for your for your own well as well, uh, have you considered putting in some kind of ultraviolet system just to? I would have no opposition to that. I mean, it's, okay. like I said, the, the bathroom's beat, so if we're going to go through the floor, we're probably going to replumb anyway. Yeah. So I'd probably think something like that, or the micron filter I love. With the uh, yeah, I, just for that extra. Absolutely, extra. and my parents' place is is down further down Cleverdale, and so we did UV to Micron to because it comes out of the lake. Thank you. Um, so will that be a contingency to add to it? I, I think it like should it. be. I yeah, I would like that. I just want to make sure. Oh yeah. Our third yeah. Well, it sounded like there was no opposition, so yeah. yeah. I think it's a good suggestion, mm -hmm. and it appears to be consensus of the board. So if you would add something that, that we do consider for approval mm -hmm. tonight. Thank you, Bob. Any other questions or thoughts or concerns before I open the public hearing? Seeing none, and, and, and if you'll have a seat, I may ask you to come back up to answer some questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. And if you will just take out one of the sanitary wipes and clean the area around you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to open the public. Anybody present who would like to speak to this application for uh, a septic hearing? Is there anybody in, in the Zoom world? Anybody in the YouTube world want to call in? Here you go, 518-761-8225. Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Any further thoughts on behalf of the town board? Bob, are, are you uh, ready for sharing your thoughts uh, for amending this uh, resolution for approval? Sure. Um, I think we just add another resolve after the resolve that has the 65 feet and 10 feet. Um, we say resolve that the variance and continued use of the septic system is contingent upon there being a working UV system as part of the well and water system. All right. Did you want to put it on the well's water, or did you want to put it on the outflow from the tank? No, no, those from the I think for the well water, no? Yeah. I thought it was the well. Yeah. I thought it was the water. Out of the water. Okay. Well, we could go either way, but this is for the well water. Right. Okay. All right. That's, that's so part of the well is water. Okay, with the board. Yep. Okay. So is there a motion to approve the resolution as amended? Motion. motion made by Councilperson McGee. Second. Seconded by Councilperson Perone. A roll call vote on this, please, Rouse. Councilperson Perone. Yes. McGee. Yes. Strau. Yes. Medivir. Yes. And Freer. Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. One more for the purposes of the local board of health. Uh, would you please introduce it to the public road? It's a public hearing on sewage disposal variance application of Sarah Landers, Amanda Sykes, and Megan Badeau. 
Okay. So we're talking about a residence owned by those three individuals on 15 Signpost Road. And um, they are installing a Claris Fusion septic system uh, with placement of a pre-existing non-conforming leach field, leach pit, 62 feet from Lakeshore shoreline in lieu of the required 100 foot setback on property located at 15 Signpost Road. So is there an agent that wishes to speak to this or one of the owners apparently? Hi. Hi. How are you? So we actually installed, you permitted in 2016, the Fusion. It was installed two, four years ago. Can you get your name? You need to, oh, I'm yourself? sorry. I'm Sarah Landers of 15 Signpost Road. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. That's okay. So we installed, with the permit from the town of Queensbury in 2016, Claris Fusion System um, in, a, in the same spot that the very antiquated non-working septic system was. Um, and then this past spring went to do a small building project to fix a porch that was falling off a cottage that was built in 1935 and the initial permit was filed and then the electrical piece passed and then I got a call from Dave Hatton saying that I needed a septic variance after chatting with him putting in a first application he sent it back and said no you don't need a septic variance you need a zoning variance and spoke with Mr. Brown Craig Brown who then after several weeks got back and said, no, it is actually a septic variance. So I resubmitted to Mr. Hatton, and here we are. Okay. So it's installed, working. It was four years ago, yeah. It's great, we have the this, UV light. I see it happen a lot. Well, and that's one of the questions I have, because I sit on the North Queensbury wastewater, mm -hmm. and I know several of us in Dunham's Bay have installed these Clara systems with permits, but didn't need to get variances then, so I'm just you answered yeah, a lot well. of questions for me because <laughs> yeah, okay. mm -hmm. I saw the deck and I saw the green top of the yeah. system and I said, it's there. Right, we already did it. So, um, yeah, every once in a while this just happens. Okay. It, it, it's, it's weird, but okay. you're not the only one. Okay. So, we, I think we followed the rules. We did what we were supposed to do. Right. right. It works and it's got the UV light, so although it's a seepage pit that's there, it's sterile water that comes out. Um, we got as far away from the lake as we could without. Yeah, well, and then if you will, so let me explain to the public that the 100 foot is for your traditional systems. You have put in a pre-treatment system, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, it's one of the best, mm -hmm. it's the Claris Fusion 450. Yeah. And in addition to that, an ultraviolet system. So that water, going out to the field, you know, the scientists claim it's drinkable, I'm not going to try yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take the word. <laughs> but what's going out to your leach bed is, is, is been heavily treated yes. as opposed to not in your traditional system. So I just want to point that out to you folks. So, is there, are there any questions before we open the public hearing from the town board? I would just want to commend you on how you get down to that house <laughs> back because I went yeah, down there today and it was <laughs> yes quite steep. It is. It is not not always fun, <laughs> but we don't use it in the winter. Okay, uh, Sarah, I'm going to ask the public if they have any questions, and I may call you back to answer some of those questions. Okay. So, have a seat, please. For cleaning up the area. So, um, is, you know, I'll, is there anybody here that wishes to speak to uh, this uh, 15 signpost road uh, resolution seeking variances, uh, variants, one variance? So, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody present? Anybody in the Zoom world? No little blue hands. Um, anybody watching YouTube which call in? Area code 518-761-8225. All right. Not having any takers, I'll close the public hearing. Any further thoughts or questions on behalf of the town board? 
I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, Council Person Freer, uh, and who seconds it? Council Person Medivere, roll call vote on this, please, Rose. Council Person McGee? Yes. Strau? Yes. Medivere? Yes. Freer? Yes. And Perot? Yes. All right. Would you like to be a, you can go ahead with your next project. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for the uh, Queensbury Local Board of Health. Uh, can I have a motion to move out of the Queensbury Local Board of Health? Please? So moved. Second. Moved by Council Person Brown, seconded by Council Person Freer. All those in favor of moving out of the Queensbury Local Board of Health, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, it's unanimous. We're now out of the Local Board of Health. So now we're just down to nine more puppies here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was looking forward to the night. No, I wasn't. I threatened that he'd become very <laughs> ill and have uh, Deputy Supervisor uh, Tony Medivere take over tonight. Um, all right, so uh, next thing we're going to be looking at is we have uh, three environmental control districts. And these are districts, um, whether it's septic, and or invasive species that was set up to try and manage their bodies of water. And we're talking about Lake Sunnyside, Glen Lake, and Lake George. And it's their money they're spending. So uh, the first hearing that we have is for, well, please introduce the folks. A public hearing on 2021 Glen Lake Aquatic Plant Growth Control District Benefit Tax Rule. Okay. Paul McPhillips, Paul Derby, and the Glen Lake Association uh, are, are doing an amazing job with Glen Lake. If you know Glen Lake, and they all know I do, on Sunday mornings, you usually see me paddle by. Sometimes you go in your place to hide from me, I know. <laughs> but that lake has significantly improved, and it's through the efforts of the folks I just mentioned. And so um, what they're proposing is that their rate in controlling invasive species uh, for the benefit tax rule is going to remain the same as it was last year. And uh, I don't see Paul McPhillips, but Paul Derby, the former president, is here, if we have any questions. So there's no changes in the rate, in the benefit tax rule. So it would be about $140 uh, per unit, $70 for a half unit, and so forth. Um, so are there um, any thoughts before I open the public hearing? Uh, all right. Uh, I'll open the public hearing on this matter. Is there anybody here tonight that wishes to speak to the proposed uh, tax rule for the Glen Lake Aquatic Plant Growth Control District? It's the same as it was last year. Anybody on Zoom? Anybody watching YouTube? Please call 518-761-8225. And this is where I have a sip of my coffee, and you notice it's a large coffee tonight. <laughs> All right, having no one wishes to speak to the uh, proposed uh, tax, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Close I'll close the public oh. hearing and entertain a motion to approve. Motion made by uh, Super, uh, uh, Council Person McGee. I'll second. Seconded by Council Person Medivere. Roll call vote, please, Rose. Council Person Medivere. Yes. Freer. Yes. Barone. Yes. McGee. Yes. And Straub. Yeah. Oh, eight more to go. <laughs> All right, well, the next one, too, is the Lake Sunnyside folks are doing a great job at Lake Sunnyside as well. Please, um, yeah, so we're, we're proposing a tax roll and it's proposing to be the same. It's for the uh, Lake Sunnyside Aquatic Plant Growth Control District. And um, the pre-unit price uh, would be $72 per 
and 42.4 cents. Um, and if it's one and a half unit, it would be $108.64. If it's a half a unit, it'll be $36.21 and so forth. So, uh, town board, we should speak to this before I open the public hearing. I just think we should make a, a broad policy that we use whole dollars for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. And it's a little weird. Uh, anybody here wish to speak uh, to the uh, Lake Sunnyside Aquatic Plant Control District Benefit Tax Roll, which they, they proposed to us here. that we approve it as the same as it was last year for the year 2021. Anybody on Zoom? You wish to call in, you're watching YouTube at Terry Code 518 761 8225. All right, I'll close the public hearing. Any last thoughts on behalf of the town board? I'll um, entertain a motion to uh, approve. So moved. Okay, we'll call vote on this, please. Councilperson Freer. Yes, but I wish they'd use whole dollars. <laughs> Perone. Yes. McGee. Yes. Strau. Yeah. And Metabier. Yes. Next year. Next year. All right. The next is introduce, please, Rose. A public hearing on 2021 North Queensbury Wastewater District Dunham's Bay Benefit Tax Roll. All right, well, this district, when he set it up, uh, is one of the first in New York State, one of the most progressive, and I would say one of the most effective. The septic system improvements that have gone on around Dunham's Bay as a result of the formation of this district, uh, which has enabled them to get grant money to assist in building of upgraded septic systems, has led to uh, scientific data showing improvements in the water quality of Dunham's Bay, directly related to the septic system improvement. The type of algae that we look for, which is the algae strongly associated with human waste, strong reductions, and so it's proven to be very, very good, and you've got a very uh, dedicated group of people. So with the COVID thing and everything else, and the pre-improvements that they have already have done, uh, they're asking for an 85% reduction in the benefit tax flow so that uh, from this year to next year, 2021. The per unit contribution from the people in this district will be $10. Half a unit, five, two units, 20, and so forth. Okay, any thoughts on this before I open the public hearing? I like the fact that they could round to a nearest dollar. <laughs> I think we're up to, what, 17 replaced systems at this point? Something like that, Tommy. It's only got like 62 properties, right? It, it's amazing what they've done. Yeah, no. And I ran into uh, Barb Sims the other day, congratulate her. She had a really nice article done in the, in the uh, watersheds. Was it the Watersheds newsletter? What, for the yeah. district? Yeah. It's, it's the North Queensbury Wastewater Disposal District. No, they wrote a story about her and, and what she's done. Oh, Sims, was, Barb? Yeah. Barb Sims, oh yeah. It was amazing. Well, this is a project, I'm glad you brought that up. This is a project where uh, Lan and Barb Sims took the leadership with others around Donald's Bay to form this district. This wasn't a top-down. This district was a grassroots effort. 
And they came to us and said, would you help us form this district? And we said, by golly, yes, this is a very good thing. So this is a town board that will work with folks that want to improve the environment, improve the water quality. You'll find us 100% there with you, working with you. All right, so um, such as it is, um, I'll open the public hearing on um, setting the uh, benefit tax roll for uh, North Queensbury or Dunnos Bay, as we call the wastewater disposal district. Is there anybody present that wishes to speak to this proposed tax roll? Anybody on Zoom? If you wish, you can make the call in. If you're watching us through YouTube, it's area code 518-761-8225. All right. Hearing no interest from the public to speak to this, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by uh, Council Person Freer. Second. Seconded by Council Person McGee. We'll roll call vote on this, please. Council Person Ferrone. Yes. McGee. Yes. Strau. Yes. Medivir. Yes. And Freer. Yes. Okay. Uh, those are our three environmental districts. Uh, now we're moving on to having uh, uh, five septic districts. The last public hearing, and that's probably why some of you are here, is to talk about a renewable energy system and facilities regulation law. Uh, so, but before we get to that, we have these uh, sewer district benefit tax rolls to deal with, and we have public hearings on each one tonight. So, Rose, if you want to introduce the first one to the public. It's a public hearing. Public hearing on 2021 Queensbury Consolid Consolidated Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Rule. All right, and the uh, uh, Director of Wastewater and Superintendent of Water is also here to answer any questions if you have any. Chris Harrington. All right, so Queensbury Sewer. Um, this is up proposed to be up seven tenths of a percent for 2021. We have a public hearing on this tonight, but before we do the public hearing on the proposed uh, Queensbury Consolidated Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll, are there any town board thoughts or questions? No. All right, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody present wish to speak to this uh, benefit tax roll for uh, Queensbury Consolidated uh, Sanitary Sewer District? Anybody on Zoom? Folks watching on YouTube Live, call area code 518-761-8225. All right, having no interest in discussing this uh, public hearing, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion to approve. So, so moved. Moved by Council Person Perrault. Second. Second by Council Person Freer. Roll call vote on this, please, Rose. Council Person McGee? Yes. Strau? Yes. Medivere? Yes. Freer? Yes. And Perrault? Yes. Next, please, Rose, introduce to the public. It's a public hearing on 2021 Reservoir Park Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll. All right, this is a very, very, very small. Reservoir Park, because it's located over near the um, Halfway Brook Reservoir. Um, public hearing on this tonight. It's an older system. It even has clay pipe. And it's a small system, so um, they're going to be impact more impacted by prices and repairs and um, Chris Harrington would, is anticipating some repair work would like a little bit more reserve in this area. So they're proposing a 6.7% increase for 2021. So we have a public hearing on this. Any uh, town board 
Nothing. All right, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody present wish to speak to the uh, Reservoir Park Sanitary Sewer District benefit tax roll being proposed for 2021? Nobody present? YouTube? Zoom? YouTube? Area code 518-761-8225? Okay, we covered all our bases for the public hearing. Well, I'll close the public hearing uh, and entertain a resolution to approve adopting Reservoir Park Sanitary Sewer District benefit tax roll for 2021. I'm over. Moved by Councilperson Minervier. Second. Seconded by Councilperson McGee. A roll call vote on this, please, Rose. Councilperson Stroh. Yes. Medivere? Yes. Freer? Yes. Barone? Yes. And McGee? Yes. Okay. If you will, Rose, please introduce our next. It's a public hearing on 2021 Route 9 Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll. All right, so this is the Route 9 Sewer District and proposing a 3.2% increase. And this is part of, you probably read about it in the papers, that um, we've had several breaks in the Meadowbrook Road area, over near the car dealerships. Uh, uh, and I want to thank the car dealerships for being very cooperative with us in repairing these fixes and the inconvenience that it cost them. But the pipes were buried decades ago and they were not wrapped as they should in acidic wet soil so we we're replacing them and that has a cost to it so in order to meet the cost this is uh we're proposing that 2021 go up 3.2 percent from 2020. there is a public hearing on this tonight tell more thoughts that's not a good I'll open the public hearing. Anybody here wish to speak to the uh, Route 9 Sanitary Sewer District benefit tax roll for 2021? Zoom. So, anybody from YouTube? Area code 518-761-8225. So moved. Moved Second. by Councilperson Perone, seconded by Councilperson Freer. All right, roll call vote on this, please. Councilperson Medivere? Yes. Freer? Yes. Perone? Yes. McGee? Yes. And Stroud? Yeah. So that passed. So, Rose, if you want to introduce the next public hearing. It's a public hearing on 2021 South Queensbury, Queensbury Avenue Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll. Okay, this is going down 3.2%. The, uh, the South Queensbury, Queensbury Avenue Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll. I'll open the public hearing, anybody present? wish to speak to the uh, South Queensbury, Queensbury Avenue Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll being proposed for 2021. Anybody in Zoom? Anybody in YouTube? Area code 518-761-8225. I think it's pretty boring to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion to approve. Make motions. All right, motion made by Councilperson McGee, seconded second. by Councilperson Medivere. We'll call vote on this, please. Councilperson Freer. Yes. Barone? Yes. McGee? Yes. Strau? Yes. And Medivere? Yes. Yeah. We're getting there. If you want to introduce the next public hearing. It's a public, yep, it's a public hearing on 2021 West Queensbury Consolidated Sanitary Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll. Okay, West Queensbury Consolidated Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll for 2021. And that's going down 8.1% uh, because there's a, a ban, a bond, uh, 
expended for 30 years, so the costs, their annual costs are down. So the rates will be lower by 8.1%. So uh, I will open the public hearing on West Queens Ferry Consolidated Sewer District Benefit Tax Roll for 2021. Proposed to go down 8.1%. Anybody present wish to speak to this? Anybody in zone? Anybody on YouTube? Area code 518-761-8225. Okay, I'll close the public hearing and entertain the motion to approve. John, could I just make a comment about, uh, before we um, do that, is that um, we've been asked several times whether the whole town is paying for some of these sewer repairs, right? And it's important to note that the reason we're, we, we've broken this down is so that the people who are getting the service are paying for both the service and the sustainability of those individual systems. It, it would be nice but not easy to do more consolidation. And I understand that the reason that we have so many of these is because uh, there's different rates for different repair and, and capabilities, but the people who are getting the service are paying, and that's why we're going through this drill. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good point. I'll make a motion to accept this. All right, motion to approve, made by uh, uh, Councilperson Freer, seconded by... I'll second. Councilperson Medivere, roll call vote on this, please, Rose. Councilperson Perone. Yes. McGee? Yes. Strau? Yeah. Medivir? Yes. And Freer? Yes. All right. Four <laughs> districts are done for another year. Okay. Next, Rose. It's a public hearing on a local law to amend Queensbury Town Code to establish renewable energy systems and facilities regulations. All right. This whole process began, I think, about three years ago when there was a, um, a, um, not a roof mounted, but a uh, uh, ground mounted system. Ground mounted system, thank you. Uh, in a neighborhood with, you know, average lots for the 1970s, <coughs> 80s, 90s era. Uh, and uh, some of the neighbors found it uh, obtrusive. We didn't have any codes to Benny yet. So this was an effort to try and put some regulation on ground-mounted solar. And uh, Councilperson Freer worked on this, and uh, he wanted it applicable to possibly other areas, at least since we're creating a new chapter um, in our code. To deal with this, we're going to label it renewable energy systems and facilities regulations. So it may be perhaps someday more than solar. Um, the proposed law will have no significant additional restrictions on rooftop. Uh, ground mounted, freestanding, both thermal and solar, there's going to be a minimum lot size of one acre. There's going to be a 75 foot setback, not in the front yard, not permitted, height restriction at 12 feet, <coughs> uh, screening and harmony with the neighborhood, um, total uh, uh, square footage cannot exceed the building square footage on the lot, and the ground mounted will be permitted in all zoning districts if they basically meet those kind of requirements. So we also said, I'm summarizing a law that's you know fairly thick, but this is the essence of it, a lot of it's legal stuff. Solar farms. Uh, solar farms will be allowed in, in three zones because that's where the interest has been for solar farms. Nothing occurred yet, but the interest is there. Highway intensive, a commercial light industrial, and land conservation. So you will need a minimum of five acres. 
there won't be any specific setback requirements. Uh, site plan review will be required uh, by the planning board. And you will need approval by the planning board to put in a solar farm. So, um, again, those are some of the highlights of the proposed law. Harrison, is there anything that you wish to add to those highlights? Well, just the idea that the solar farm is going to um, actually make um, energy available off-site and as uh, the residential and ground-mounted solar that you described at the beginning will be for on-site use and not for uh, sale or rent or lease um, off the premises, I think is the idea. You mean the ground mounted solar? Well, yeah, and the roof mounted resonance. Yeah, and the roof mounted. All right. So uh, there is a public hearing on this. Is there any other com voucher comments on behalf of the board before I open the public hearing? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here tonight that wishes to speak to this resolution, which is doing both? It's, for, it's adopting a negative secret declaration. And it's adopting the law, open one resolution. So, and again, it's the uh, Renewable Energy Systems and Facilities Regulations. Nobody present wish to speak to this? All right, anybody? I'm surprised, I figured this would have some public comment. Anybody through YouTube wish to ask a question or offer a comment to the proposed law? Please call area code 518 761 8225. Okay. Can I make one, two more comments? Yes, now? yes. Now's the opportunity for the town board to speak again. So I'd like to thank uh, Craig Brown for his patience in working with me on this, and I'll also uh, thank uh, Catherine Atherton, who um, actually initiated this process uh, when she was uh, on the town board, because uh, it's something that I think is going to continue to be of big interest, uh, and the state is making sort of large uh, moves in this area. So uh, this will replace the moratorium that we've had in place uh, for almost a year. And uh, both of those uh, individuals d deserve credit for uh, us getting on this page. And you're right, and thank you for bringing it up. And it also makes me think that, you know, this town board, everyone on this town board has worked on this. So I want to thank you too and town council uh, they've reviewed it and they've made suggestions, so I want to thank them as well. So the product that you see here, uh, you know, is, is the product of a lot of work that went into this to get us to this point. We didn't want to be overly intrusive with this, but we wanted to provide some regulation. And I kind of highlighted the important things, and the public doesn't seem to have anything unacceptable in their liking about this proposal. So, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Adopt, uh, I'll close the public hearing, thank you, Rose, and adopt a secret negative declaration and enacting the law to amend the Great Town Go to establish a renewable energy systems and facilities regulation. So moved. I'll second. Moved by Council Person Freer, seconded by Council Person McGee. Roll call vote on this, please, Rose. Mm -hmm. Did you go through the. No. The full oh, environmental the assessment form. form. Yeah, you go, I'm did, sorry. did you do that in a meeting? I wasn't at it. Looked like you. That's what we're yeah, doing. Yeah, well, we have now. the form here, and if you'll so, you'll want me to lead you through it. Part yeah. B. Yeah. With, Has uh, everyone had a chance to look at the uh, full environmental assessment form, part one, to uh, go through and figure out the, the facts that's sort of laid out? I can lead you through the questions in part two if you wish. Um, this is part two of the full environmental assessment form. Question number one, um, impact on land. Um, 
you want to read that? No. Do you want to go ahead and read what basically what they're saying about the impact on land, and then we'll address it? Bob, or do you no, if you, you if you if you've all gone through the process and are yeah, ready to give right. your your uh, analysis. So um, the impact there... on land, the consensus is no. 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 Okay. Go ahead, okay. please, Bob. Number two, impact on geological features. No. no. Number three, impacts on surface water. No. 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 Number four, impacts on groundwater. No. no. Impact on five, impact, sorry, number five, impact on flooding. No. no. Number six, impacts on air. No. 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 Um, number seven, impacts on plants and animals. No. 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 Number nine, impacts on agricultural resources. No. no. Act, uh, number nine, impact on aesthetic resources. No. no. Uh, ten, impact on historic and archaeological resources. No. no. And I want to point out to the public that we're talking about the law, not a specific project. Okay. Right. Eleven. Eleven is impact on open space and recreation. No. no. Number 12 is the impact on critical environmental areas. No. no. Number 13 is the impact on transportation. No. no. Number 14 is the impact on energy. No. 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 Well, yes. yeah, negative. <laughs> but not a negative. <laughs> not a harmful impact. No. No. Correct. No. Number 15, impact on noise, odor, and light. No. no. 16, impact on human health. No. No. And again, uh, no negative. <laughs> Number 17, consistency with community plans. No. no. Number 18, consistency with community character. No. 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 So, the so stands as the negative. And the resolution that you have before you as is part of it, the uh, negative declaration. Okay. So, uh, entertain a motion to approve our new law. So moved. All right. Again. Again. Second it. Second and time. Moved by uh, Council Person Freer, seconded mm -hmm. by uh, Council Person McGee. Roll call vote on this, please. Council Person McGee. Yes. Strau. Yeah. Medivere. Yes. Freer. Yes. And Ferrum. Yes. Congratulations. That's a major. Good job, Harrison. All right, next um, I'm going to, we have seven resolutions before us tonight. I'm going to briefly describe each one if you wish to speak to it. I'm going to give you the opportunity to speak to any of the resolutions. If you're here to talk about, or you're there to talk about some other town issue, I will give you the opportunity to do so after the resolutions, but this part of the meeting is just to the resolutions. So, would you introduce resolution 4.1 to the public, please, Rose? So, resolution authorizing restoration reconstruction of Foster Avenue, Upper Glen Street intersection by Edward and Thomas O'Connor, Inc. All right, we had a, um, um, a blowout, a water main blowout on Foster Avenue as it intersects with Route 9 over near the Price Chopper. And in order to repair that, we had to disturb the curbing, we had to disturb Route 9. In New York State, when you replace it, it has to be replaced according to their standards. So we communicated with them we developed a design that meets their standards, and um, now it's time to restore and reconstruct the roadway. So we got the lowest quote, we went out to bed, and we got a lowest quote from uh, Edward and Thomas O'Connor, dated 7, September 16, 2020, for an amount of $34,125. Yes, an expensive water main break, but we don't have any options. And I think the people that live in the area will want us to repair it in the same standards that the state expects. 
So we have that resolution before us. Next resolution. Resolution authorizing lo local tourism promotion and convention development agreement with World Awareness Children's M Museum. All right, so the uh, World Awareness Children's Museum, and I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Tuba for all they've done to make that cultural asset a reality. They're asking for $3,600 of occupancy tax to help them develop uh, uh, a digital world that they'll promote the students. I'm sure someday the world will return to normal, so they need uh, the camera, and they need archival work and editing. They need some uh, editing and advertising and uh, some software. And so they're asking us for $3,600 in this world of COVID where they're not experiencing a lot of revenue income to develop something that will develop revenue at some point. And we use OCTEX for this because, um, you know, when there was a study done on tourism in our area, about 39% of the respondents said that they attend our area for a variety of reasons, but 39% said for the cultural and historical aspects that our community offers. So, you know, we're talking about everything from the Ephraim Williams Monument to Fort William Henry to the Chapman Museum, the Hyde Museum, and the uh, World Awareness Children's Museum. All those great assets do help attract people to visit our area. And so that's what I think it's all about. So that's resolution 4.2. 4.3, please. Resolution authorizing electrical work at Highway Building by Hewitt Young Electric. Well, as you know, for decades, uh, people have talked about the need for a new highway building. The other building is dilapidated, it's been worked on, and we have the engineers analyze it, and they said, well, listen, don't waste your money. But the building will be good for storage, cold storage, and we need cold storage. We have a lot of equipment setting outside. So we're building a new highway building. That's probably no secret to you. Another thing that's no secret is when you're building a new building like this, and you've got a big project like this, you're going to come across things that you didn't foresee in the first round. All right, this one was we were going to bring electric over to the new building from the old building and so forth. The electric is so old it's not advised that we work with it to bring electricity over. So it needs to be replaced. So um, we did we'll go out and get the quotes for the reconstruction. The lowest quote was from Hewitt Young Electric, dated September 16, 2020, in the amount of $16,600 to upgrade our electric system in that area. Resolution 4.4. So resolution affirming consistency of site plans as modifications to the Fowler, Squ Fowler Square planned unit development. All right, this resolution, uh, Fowler Square is the PUD, uh, a planned unit development. And uh, they have new people working with them. Uh, the, the owners of Queensbury Partners as partnered, I believe partnered, would be the best term with some new firms that are going to make this finally happen. I think it's going to be a wonderful project. And um, they've tweaked it. I mean, for example, uh, they came to the town board at a workshop, and that was Zoom, uh, and was made public. That's out there and recorded. And uh, they want to tweak some things with this uh, Father Square PUD. I mean, for example, uh, the garbage uh, pickup. What was there was pretty much non-existent. They wanted to design something and modernize it with today's pickup standards and so forth. The doors of some of the apartments were arranged such that when you parked in the parking area, you had to walk around the building to get into your apartment. That didn't make sense. So they have redesigned those apartments so that you park, you go on the door. Bingo. Uh, so they uh, have redefined the ingress and egress points. And uh, so they tweaked it a little bit here and there. They twisted the buildings here and there to make it better. Uh, they've got some very nice designs. Um, you know, we've got all this material from them. Here's some of the looks. 
Maybe I don't know. Can you see this? My zoom camera is zoom it in. Anyhow, it's going to have 142 apartments and some commercial space and some space that they're going to use uh, for their own purposes, for the management of the whole entity and so forth. So we've reviewed the plan for consistency. And if this board thinks that this project is fairly consistent, they will vote approval on the consistency. That's what this resolution is Next resolution, please. Resolution authorizing purchase of skid steer loader for use by highway department. All right, so the highway department, uh, Superintendent of Highways, David Duell, and his deputy, Superintendent Mark Benware, are both here. And so, uh, as you know, CHIPS money is money that can be used for paving and or equipment used for paving and so forth. Uh, and we're very worried about next year, are you going to get any CHIPS? They're not going to allow a rollover, because usually they did. You know, there's so many question marks. We want to spend this year's chip. So it's going to benefit the taxpayers of getting equipment now and using the chips money. Then that's what the highway department wants to do, and I think it's a good thing. So they want to purchase a skid steer loader. And it's going to be used for multiple things. It's going to be used for paving. It can be even used for uh, clearing the snow and so forth. Um, the purchase total of this, it's a town Bobcat 863 and with a total purchase price of $64,030 as set forth in Milton Katz quote dated 9-23-2020 presented at this meeting. So it's in accordance with New York State Office of General Services Procurement Services Contract PC 66988. So the amount is $74,030.20 minus the trade in. So that's uh, $10,000. So it comes to $64,030.20. Okay? I think it's approved. 4.6, please, Rose. Resolution authorizing purchase of 2020 model HB 513 International 6x4 dump, plow, and wing truck for highway department. All right, so again, this is the chips money, and this is uh, to buy a new snow plow. Uh, you know, a few years ago we did an analysis because uh, somebody made the claim that we've got the uh, Cadillac of highway department materials. Our average vehicle is 16 years old. So some people talk without knowing what they're talking about. All right, our job is to make sure that your, your, your roads get plowed. And we can only plow them with good equipment. With 20 and 25 year old equipment that's breaking down, and we need to have 20 plows off the road. And we need to have a couple backup plows because even, you know, they break down. So our new building will house those plows. So this is a truck a plow and a six by four dump combination. It's a, uh, it's a uh, vehicle that we can get now and we're using chips money and the total amount will be $201,031.86 as set forth in HAL gauge sales quote dated September 15, 2020. And it'll be reimbursed to town, and we'll be using our chips money for this. If it passes, it's kind of work. And the last resolution before us tonight, please. Resolution approve. Resolution approving out of bills warrant of um, 9 29 2020. Okay, and one date of uh, September 24th, and the payment date of September 29th, $279,947. Those are the resolutions before us tonight, and I will, first of all, before I open the public to think, uh, to share their thoughts, or any of the resolutions 
you want to speak to before I do that? Okay, anybody here wish to speak to any of the resolutions before the stump board tonight? Nobody present? Anybody's own? When did the PUD project start, John? When, uh, he was a young man. He was, he, 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 1985. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations and good luck with all that. Thank you. That was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. That was <laughs> All right, so um, anybody wish to call in with any thoughts on the resolutions before this town board tonight? The YouTube, area code 518 761 8225. I didn't know if he raised his hand. Either or. All right. We'll go with Perone. <laughs> Roll call vote, please. Councilperson Strau. Yes. Medivir? Yes. Freer? Yes. Perone? Yes. And Mickey? Yes. Okay. Now, any correspondence, Rose? Just one. Uh, the 2021 tentative budget has been received, distributed to the town board members, and a copy will be on file in the town clerk's office. My budget goes to the town board. It's the town board. Okay. Uh, and we will have public hearings on that in early November. And, um, okay. So, now is the privilege of the floor to talk to the town board. Good luck to you guys. Uh, talk to the town board about any town matter. Is there anybody present who would like to talk to the town board tonight? Yes, sir, if you please come forward and introduce yourself and then discuss the topic. Hi, my name is Warren Valero. Um, I'm a seven year resident of Queensbury. All right, Warren. And um, V-O-L-L-A-R-O. -L -L All right, a good Italian name, huh? <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so, um. The issue I'm bringing up tonight is um, I live at 686 Upper Glen Street, which is adjacent to uh, Glendale Drive. And I believe we fall under, we're in Ward 2, District 3, which is Mr. Freer's district, I believe. Um, so the, the problem we have is on Glendale Drive is O'Reilly Auto Parts, um, they do deliveries at 2 o'clock in the morning, five nights a week. And I was hoping some of my fellow residents would come to corroborate my story. But um, they, what, what's happening is they're, they're waking us up at that time and we all have to go to work. So I, I did some research and I found out a Department of uh, Transportation determination. It's a, it's a dead end street that's less than 1,000 feet with no cul-de-sac. So the truck has to cross two lanes of Route, route 9, both northbound and southbound lanes, blocking the traffic to back up into the Glendale Drive to do their delivery. And so what I found out is that um, the Department of Transportation has an Article 342-93, which states any 12 to 18 wheel vehicle may not enter a residential dead end equal to or less than 1,000 feet 
with no cul-de-sac present. A no through traffic sign has been deemed unenforceable to this designate, which means they really can come into the street to do the delivery, but there is a law by the Department of Transportation with a, a short dead end. There's, there's no turnaround. There's five residences on Glendale Drive, and I'm not sure if we're zoned as a commercial area or a residential area. It's zoned commercial. It's zoned commercial. So, um, and I know I'm aware there's no sound ordinance in Queensbury either, but my neighbors were, you know, we're all getting together and they were complaining to me. And I said, well, let's go to a town board meeting, present our case to the town board. I'm sorry, what was your first name again? Warren. Warren. Warren, um, maybe I can make this simple here. I was on the planning board at the time when that O'Reilly uh, project was approved. And I know there were concerns by the folks who lived on that road, and they expressed those during that meeting. And whoever the representative was from O'Reilly, I don't recall who, I don't know if it was their developer or whatever. But um, I believe it's on the record that they were not supposed to bring semi-tractor trailers in there. They had said that the deliveries for that store was gonna come from a larger store in Albany, I believe, but they said they were only going to use box trucks. Now, uh, that's right. That, yes, yes. Uh, you know that that's part of the problem. I, again, the other part with deliveries early in the morning. I don't know if we, what we could do about well, that. Well, it's it. You know, the, it's not more early in the morning. It's what happens is the truck blocks both the northbound and southbound lane to back into Glendale Drive. And I, I went out a couple of nights to see, and someone almost slammed right into the truck. But uh, your, your, your contention is that it's being done at night. It's being done at 2 o'clock in the morning, five nights a week, though. One night a week I could see. What do they need five nights a week out of an 18-wheeler? I mean, they, it, it takes them, like, um, approximately 40 minutes each, each delivery. So I'm wondering, what are they, you know, what do they need? I mean, is there that many customers? No. Um, Do they keep the trucks idling when they're unloading? He, 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 no, he shuts the truck off. He turns it off, but the lift and everything is so loud. And my neighbors were all, you know, there's five residences there, so we all, everybody works, nobody's unemployed. We're all workers, so I have to get up and go to work in the morning. But more of the issue also is that there have been seven major accidents on um, Upper Glen Street between Glenwood Road and Quaker Road. Uh, sometimes I don't know whether to go out with a checkered flag or or a, or a, or a caution flag. You know, it's been like that. So I, I believe that it's a danger to the public to to do this. And I wish my my neighbors were here to help me co corroborate what's happening there. Um, I don't know if there's anything you can do. Well, we can certainly look into it. And we will want. Yeah, yeah. Because see, the thing is about this Department of Transportation laws. They have to back in because if they pull in forward, there's no way for them to turn around. They, around. No, they, they can't get out of there. They can't get out of there, and they can't even turn into the parking lot that O'Reilly built in the back because it, they're, the truck, the way those trucks back up, there's not enough room for it to go back uh, into the into the. Uh, dead end, and it's a short dead end. It's, it's I an believe extremely it's, narrow street. It's too. extremely narrow, and it's about 750 feet, I believe. Well, that's where flower land used to be back there. So, um, so anyhow, that's a ward two. Yes. And so, would you please send us your contact information? Use our sure. website. You can either send it to me okay. or ward two representative Harrison Freer, and we'll look into that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak to the town board about any town topic? You do too bad. No. Anybody out there on the Zoom room? Anybody in YouTube? 518-761-8225. Okay, yeah, it's earlier than I thought. I know. I would be later. I'm impressed. All right, so. Good thing I didn't bet. <laughs> uh, town board discussions. Uh, let's we'll start with Tony. I actually have nothing tonight. 
although they're starting paving Sunnyside, which I just cannot believe, finally. Many years in the making. What's so, that, Tony? They said they started work on paving Sunnyside Road today. So oh, they did? I told you we're going to have a, a party when that's, when that's done. So. Less than 50 people. I know. I, I did see the equipment there in the corner. It, it's where they drove very exciting. There. You have no idea. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So I'll be able to ride my bicycle on that road again. Because right now it bends the rims. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I have a quick question for Dave Duell. When are they going to do Garrison? Tomorrow morning. Good answer. <laughs> What I thought of it was ironic is they had Bay Road closed, they had um, Fort Amherst Road closed. And Webster, because they had that main break, they had a yeah. sewer main break. Yeah. So you had to use Garrison, <laughs> all dug up and... <laughs> all set. Okay, Harrison? Well, that was my one question. I, at the risk of getting John I want a very, very sure answer to the question of when do you think uh, the Halfway Brook Trail will be usable? By the end of October. Okay, that's great. Congratulations on your bridge building skills. <laughs> Impressive. It was my fifth bridge. Well, thank you. Uh, George? No, I don't have much. I, I just uh, wanted to commend the highway department again. They always do a great job, but uh, you know they had some um, Stormwater projects they've done in Ward 3, and they do a nice job on that. So um, they all take time, but they get done one, one, one at a time. So I thank them for that. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Amanda? Appreciate it. Um, I just have a kudos. My, my family and I went to the bike trail behind um, the Great Escape, and we rode to. Um, get refreshments at the garrison. And it was beautiful. And there were families of all shapes and sizes on foot, on bike, on scooters, and some masked, some not. But it was just quintessential Lake George area autumn beauty. And I'm just grateful we have it. And yes, and we're, we're going to have a beautiful system, uh, a bike, bike system keep our population healthy and attract tourists to our area. I mean, for example, our single track trails on Gurney Lane were really the number one in New York State by singletrack.com. <laughs> so, all right, so my turn. Uh, I'm glad that we have a bulk inspection program because otherwise, fan bar and hydrilla which we discovered on infected boats may have been late George. But because they were discovered and cleaned up, they were prevented from entering Lake George. So again, speaks to the boat inspection program. And I want to thank uh, uh, Dave Wick and the Fund for Lake George and Bob Blaze and Ron Conover and uh, Queensbury is involved with it. A lot of people don't realize that Queensbury has about 13 and a half miles of Lake George coastline. Okay. We have more than probably some of the municipalities you think have a lot. We do. We've got, uh, you know, the peninsulas, of course, which create a lot of coastline. Uh, uh, you know, Cleverdale and Assembly Point and uh, Rockhurst. And we go all the way up Pilot Knob and Anyway, so a lot of people don't realize that Northern Queensbury, which has a border that extends into Lake George, and the border actually goes between Speaker Hack and Long Island and then cuts over to Port Ann. And we share that pilot now with Port Ann. All right, and that's it for me. I want to, I want to thank everybody. Uh, Joel Barlow uh, from Look TV, Peter Pay from Pay Productions. Uh, town Attorney uh, Bob Hafner, uh, Deputy Town Clerk uh, Rose, Town Board. Thank you all for coming tonight and thank you for putting up with what well, is a pretty boring meeting. <laughs> but we got through it all.
All right. How about a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Councilperson Fromm, seconded by Councilperson McGee. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. All right. We're now adjourned.